uh, with 1xm and 193 stripped out of the, the graph here. And like I said, you, there's not a whole lot of improvement. There is some improvement. I mean, the top is actually 2.1, the green line there. And then it gets muddled. But 2.3 is the fastest of the 2.x series, just not by much. What's so, the x-axis? Like, is that time? Uh, iteration is a benchmark. Uh, so normally, if I show this graph with JRuby, it'd start out slow and get much faster. With Ruby, it pretty much stays the same across. But it's basically just in, uh, multiple iterations of the same benchmark. And what's the unit on the y-axis? Uh, on the y-axis, that's just number of seconds for this uh, red flag tree. So it, it, it constructs a very large tree, traverses it several times, searches for items, deletes items out of the tree, does some rebalancing, and then throws it away. And that's essentially what the benchmark graph is, a pure Ruby version of that. Uh, again, lies, damn lies, and benchmarks are not really a, a, a macro benchmark, but probably fairly indicative of, of writing everything in Ruby. It's a data structure, a fairly common data structure written in Ruby, and this is a performance you get on CRuby. Now, if we compare CRuby and JRuby, uh, we obviously do it much better. We've been working on that for a long time. Here's where I mentioned iterations over time, JRuby will start out slower. This is where startup time, cold performance is. is not great, something we'd like to improve, but not great right now. Second iteration, we have a match MRI, and then it's pretty much just off the races from there. So we run much faster on uh, pretty much any pure Ruby code. Uh, focusing a little bit more on the beginning part here again, the startup time does take a little while to get going. We have to remind people of that when they test this out and do some benchmarking. Um, but then we're much faster. And actually, they want 3x faster, we're already four times faster. So we've got Ruby three, three, three times three right now. So I'll, talk a little, I'll back up a little bit and talk about how the, the JRuby 9000 runtime is structured. So we have our Ruby code that comes in. And then we're going to take this Ruby code and we'll parse it, turn it into an AST. So this is basically where we and uh, Ruby 187 would stop. JRuby in 1.0 and uh, CRuby in 187. This is it. In our case, it's just a tree. We walk through it and execute it. Uh, but in JRuby 9000, we take this another level. Uh, we take the AST, we run it through our compiler, uh, and that turns it into our own intermediate representation, our own IR. Uh, and this represents more uh, the semantics of the code, uh, control flow, where it's actually progressing in the code based on certain branches, uh, data flow, which values are needed, which uh, calculations are to be thrown away, dead code, and so on. Uh, so we, we do that, turn it into our IR, run some optimization passes over it, and then eventually we can take that IR, run it through our JIT, which is now much simpler because we've already got an optimized IR, uh, turn that into JVM bytecode. And then the JVM will take it and do its additional rounds of passes and, and optimizations and get much faster and actually get it down to native code. JRuby is the, the first and as far as production quality, Ruby is still the only native bytecode JIT. Uh, so what kind of cool stuff can we do with this new runtime? Uh, so a few examples that we want, I want to walk through. This is one of my favorites. Uh, so this is, a, this is not an uncommon pattern in Ruby. Uh, you want to pass a block through to another call. So you receive the block in, you capture it as an object, and then basically just unwrap it to send it through as the block for the next call. Uh, and then down to your bar, which is yield to. So essentially, I don't need this block, but I want some, some function I'm calling to use it. Uh, so on CRuby, this actually has a, a, a significant cost. It doesn't seem like it should, you're just passing the block through, but turning it into uh, an object, uh, the ampersand V at the top, through ampersand V, has to create an object to hold the block. So we get a Ruby proc out of it, and then we never use the Ruby proc. We immediately unwrap it, and then pass the raw code again through to the next call. So that proc object is just wasted. It's constructed, never used and thrown away. Uh, so we had a, uh, a community member, actually not even a JRuby contributor, he came in, he looked at our compiler for a few days, and he wrote an optimization pass for us you know, in, in our Java code with our runtime that optimizes that all the way. If it sees that you're capturing the block and immediately passing it out again, it doesn't create the object, it just sends it through. Uh, so we've got a very trivial benchmark here, just running that same code uh, through a bunch of iterations and measuring how long it takes. Uh, and here's what we get. So at the very top, CRuby 2.3, uh, 
Jerry has generally been faster. Uh, the, blue, the red line there is JRuby 1.7 without this optimization. And the yellow line is JRuby with the optimization. And this is a zero scale, so we're getting down here to like 0.25 seconds for a benchmark that, that takes uh, CRuby two seconds to run. Pruning out all of that extra overhead, that's essentially what we want to do in the compiler. Don't do work we don't need to do. When you're running these uh, benchmarks, are you, are you timing it from, from the command line, or are you, uh, like, you including the GDM start time and all that? So, I'm, I'm trying to be as honest as possible with these numbers. This is the first iteration, essentially. Okay. So, it's, it's iterations measured within the runtime. The startup of JRuby is anywhere from, you know, 0.75 seconds to 2 seconds just to get JRuby up and going. So, that's not included in here. But these are the slow numbers for JRuby at the very beginning. And then it ramps up very quickly. So this, after enough execution, we've got some compiler passes that run, we've got the JVM JIT that runs, and then we let the JVM go to the uh, So define method, another fairly common pattern, lots and lots of use in Rails and other frameworks. Um, can be hard to optimize. Uh, even CRuby still has some trouble with this. We wanted to improve the situation. Here is the performance that we get with a, a, a very simple optimization. So uh, actually here, JRuby uh, 1.7, the red line is now slower than CRuby. So this is something we always wanted to improve. Uh, the overhead of a block in JRuby is a bit higher than it is in CRuby just because of the bookkeeping required. And so our blocks have been slower. And for a simple defined method, that meant the defined method was slower. Uh, C Ruby there with the blue line in the middle, the yellow line with JRuby 9000. We basically look at the define method block, and if it could just be a method body, we turn it into a method body. It's no longer a block. It doesn't have all the overhead of extra context around it, all the overhead that goes along with blocks, and so we can actually get this pretty close to performing like a regular method. Uh, there's some more work we can do here, but we really want to get the define method to essentially just create normal methods. None of the overhead they have on the uh, This is a good one. How many people have done this in code? Everybody at some point. Uh, I hate it. I really hate this pattern. I understand the utility of it, but from a VM designer, VM optimizer perspective, it really sucks. Uh, so here what we're doing, we're making a call to foo that we assume is going to fail. There's going to be an exception. We're, we don't care about the exception. If it fails with an exception, just return nil from this expression and move on. Uh, walk away from the exception, which is certainly valid in a certain case. If you're just testing out a feature, um, a, a more concrete example here from csv.rb. Uh, so this is doing uh, common delimited lists. This is basically if you turn on the automatic conversion mode. So every value that's read out of the CSV file, it feeds through each of these converters. So it will try it as an integer, boom, that blows up, it ignores the exception, it tries it as a float, that blows up, it tries the next one, which I think is date time, and that cascades to a couple more, eventually just returning the string and giving up on it. Uh, so the problem here is that that's n exceptions, probably five or six exceptions for every value in the CSV file, whatever it is. And on JRuby, exceptions are anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times slower than on CRuby because building that stack trace is incredibly expensive. The JVM has to unwind its optimized calls. It's got code that's inline that it has to like piece apart, figure out where we actually are in the call stack. Lots of overhead that goes into that. Uh, so we, we actually introduced that optimization that we see this rescue app or we see a simple expression, so rescue, and then the result is just a, a literal value or a local variable or something very simple. Well, we can set a bit on that thread saying, don't create a stack trace. We're downstream from an exception handler that doesn't care about the exception. It's gonna throw it away. Don't generate any of that extra overhead and extra logic. So we can totally just eliminate 99% of the overhead exception. Um, so this is the performance of CRuby 2.3 versus 9.1. Significantly better. Um, CRuby still has to create the whole backtrace every time. They don't have any optimization like this. Here, 
Uh, this is essentially the performance of just doing that call many times over. It's, it's significantly faster. The cost of just the exception itself without the backtrace on the JVM is almost free. It's one object, it unrolls the stack, and it's much faster. And now you'll notice that I don't have JRuby 1.7 on here. And I told you it was much slower. Here's how much slower. So we're talking about these performance numbers in the neighborhood of 7 to 12 seconds. This is JRuby 1.7 generating a full stack trace for that exception every time. 340 seconds. And you can see why we got a performance bar about csv.rd with converters. <laughs> this is why every time it was taking a thousand times more than CRuby to do this. So we're very happy with this optimization. So straight line performance stuff. Uh, CRuby starts up the fastest. There's nothing we can really do about that. They're all native code. They're all running, they're starting hot right away. Um, we are working on improving JRuby startup, but if you want something that starts up quickly, you're doing scripting or whatever at the command line, you still use CRuby. Uh, but JRuby runs the fastest. If we don't run the fastest, let us know and there's, there's something wrong. We can fix it. Something broken. Uh, and we're continuing to get faster. This is just a handful of quick optimizations that we did. Some as compiler passes, some just being a little bit smarter about how we translate the code into our IR. Uh, but it's going to continue to get better and better. All right, so the other part of this, concurrency. Let's talk about concurrency. And really what we're talking about is parallelism. Uh, and so I gotta clarify that, of course. So concurrency, uh, let's start with parallelism. Parallelism is what happens at the lowest level, on the hardware. Uh, you actually have two computing units, two CPUs or GPUs or something, physically executing code at the same time. That's parallelism. Concurrency is what we have as an abstraction in software. So thread APIs, actor APIs, and so on. Uh, we feed it code, we expect that these things are going to get done roughly in the same period of time, but we're not paying attention to whether they actually run on the hardware at the same time. So there's a, there's a gap there. Uh, you can have concurrency without parallelism, as we did for years on single core systems. We didn't have multiple processors running stuff at the same time, but we did have the illusion of concurrency uh, by multiplexing what they do. Uh, but you can have both of these on JRuby. You can only have concurrency on CRuby because they don't have parallel threads. Um, I've done some talks. There's a, a number of libraries that we've built up over the past few years. Uh, Concurrent Ruby is probably the, the biggest one. That's now a dependency of Rails 5, a uh, dependency of several other libraries. And every concept of concurrency, parallelism you can think of, futures, promises, actors, uh, thread tools, executors, all of that have an implementation in this library. So if you're doing anything threaded in Ruby, this is the library to use, and it's the library that everyone's putting their, their work behind, concurrent Ruby. Um, so let's talk about parallelism in Ruby, what it actually looks like. So on CRuby, you can get actual parallel execution, but usually you have to spin up a separate process. <laughs> if you want it to be you know, a Ruby-intensive, uh, CPU-intensive execution, probably going to have to spin up two Ruby, C Ruby instances to get multiple processors to actually run. Uh, this works fine if there's not a lot of crosstalk and if forking other processes isn't a problem. Uh, but that can, that can be your issue. If you need to expand that to four cores, eight cores, 16 cores, 32 cores, and you've got 32 processors and probably another 32 backup processes uh, that all need to coordinate what data they're working against, Obviously, that gets messy, and that's overhead. Uh, so on JRuby, usually you're doing thread level parallelism. Uh, we don't we, we don't have a global lock. We don't have any anything to prevent parallelism. A JRuby thread maps directly to a JVM thread, which in pretty much every JVM is a system thread. So you do thread.new or an actor framework, you're actually running in parallel. Uh, and then we don't have a lot of that crosstalk. You're using the same memory. You're dealing with the same data structures, uh, for good or for bad, you don't have the overhead. You have some synchronization issues possibly, but uh, definitely much faster. If you want to get full-on fast parallelism, this is the way you need to do it. So the example I have here, it's like a simple mailing queue uh, where there's some amount of processing time for each of the emails, and we've got thousands of these that we need to send out. Uh, so we're going to feed these jobs into some worker, uh, construct all these emails to send, and presumably with some amount of overhead to generate them, uh, and then send them out. Um, this is from a, a little blog post. Someone was just experimenting with parallelism. Uh, you can take a look at it if you like. 
So here is a single credit merger. It's just going to uh, insert 10,000 mail jobs and, and run them right, right in line. Uh, so this is mailer.deliver. This is actually doing full processing and sending out some, uh, some email. The concurrent version is a little bit more complicated. So we've got a thread pool. Uh, we're creating pool size number of threads in this list. Uh, we are feeding all of our jobs into a queue, 10,000 times per job into this queue, and then just let all of our threads eat away at that queue until it's all done. Chew through them as fast as possible, ideally running across multiple threads. Uh, so if we look at CRuby, the, the synchronous, the single threaded version, and the four threaded version, unsurprisingly, are about the same performance. And actually, if you look carefully, the four threaded version is slightly, slightly slower. When you spin up that first thread on a CRuby, it starts doing more inter-thread checks. There's a little bit more safeguards involved at the runtime level. So threads can actually have a small uh, decrease in performance for that first one. And then you get none of the parallel capabilities up. You're not actually using the processors any better. You're just getting that illusion of concurrency. Uh, of course, on JRuby, well, actually it's probably worth saying. So there's the fourth version. Again, we're spinning up multiple processes. We've got the hassle of managing those processes and communicating with them. But we are getting three to four times improvement by running on separate processes. Uh, and then, of course, on JRuby, it's the same thing. Uh, <coughs> oh, no. oh, it's back. Good. OK. Uh, so here's the synchronous version, the, threaded ver or the single threaded version, which is faster than CRuby, but obviously a big jump just by spinning up a few threads. Um, and this just comes automatically. You can do this very easily with the concurrent Ruby library or just spinning up threads on your own. Uh, and so this isn't too bad. So CRuby ports. Uh, 3.9, 3.09 times faster. Overall, they're much slower, but they get roughly the same ratio of performance for, for spinning up processes. I think they lose some of this in just the cost of spinning up the forks, maintaining those sub processes, and so on. Uh, JRuby threads, though, definitely doing better and much less hassle to, to actually get the parallel out of it. Um, so people always say threads are bad, right? How much of every thread got news? Lots of synchronization problems. <laughs> So the truth is, most of you will never actually have to do thread.new, construct a new thread, and, and conceptualize what parallel execution is in your application. Uh, you deploy Rails, Rails will parallelize it. If you're running on a server, server like Puma or Quarterbox, uh, it will just use multiple threads. Rails itself, they've done a lot of work to make sure internally it's thread safe. So your entire site, which was five or 10 or 100 instances before, may boil down to one JRuby instance. Um, we've heard people cutting their, their number of processes, and in some cases, the number of machines that they have to use by as much as 10 times, just by going to JRuby and getting better <coughs> some hardware, um, and sometimes 100 times. Uh, the libraries and frameworks like, like the current Ruby will usually do this work for you. Uh, write your application in at least a reasonable way to keep your stuff local to that request, and you're probably not going to have too much trouble. Um, and then, of course, on JRuby, just by using Rails, using Puma, using some of these libraries, you'll automatically get some parallelism on it. Uh, one of the stories that I like the most, uh, how many people deploy on AWS for something? A few folks, yeah. Uh, so we had a, how many people have ever deployed on AWS? There, okay. So we got the context. Uh, so, AWS can get surprisingly expensive when you start spinning up larger instances. We had a, a, a Ruby user that had a very large application. They were running, what was it, 35 extra large instances of their application. Lots of money that was going into this app. Uh, they spent about a week or two, I think, doing a conversion from CRuby over to JRuby so they could take better use of the hardware, get better performance. They dropped it from those 35 extra larges down to, I think, 10 mediums. So anyone who's ever priced out AWS stuff, this is tens of thousands of dollars that they save every month just by making a move to JRuby and using the hardware there. So there you go. So we're done, right? Uh, we've got high performance. We've got good parallelism. Uh, move to JRuby. Application's going to be fast, and we're good to go, right? Uh, well. It is possible to write good, efficient, and parallel Ruby code and write really good applications the first time you write it. Uh, so if you do it for a long time, maybe you're perfect at it. 
but it's also extremely easy to write really inefficient Ruby applications and Ruby code, <coughs> bad, bad applications. And just having a faster runtime or a more parallel runtime is not enough. Uh, we need to have some way to look into the system. So there's a lot of great features in Ruby. Uh, like I mentioned, blocks can be expensive to execute. They can also be expensive to create. So when you have like three or four levels of nested blocks, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to construct all those blocks for every one of those loops. Uh, case when, a lot of folks don't realize it's not like a, a constant time switch from C or Java. It's checking each of those individually. So it's an O of N doing all those extra calls. Um, singleton classes and methods seem really cheap, but extremely expensive on both C Ruby and J Ruby. Lots of really nice literals. Uh, we've started to see some improvement in, in Ruby 2.3, you can now flag a file as being all frozen strings, which will reduce that overhead of constantly creating new strings all the time. But there's still a lot of literal objects being thrown away. Uh, and I mentioned exceptions being expensive. So what happens if you've got your code out there and it just doesn't run fast enough? Uh, well, you need to be able to look into your application to see what's happening. And in order to do that, you have to have good tools. Uh, CRuby has some of these tools, but by far, the JVM has much better tools for doing performance analysis, digging into the internals of your application. Um, so let's look at CRuby. There are some basic GC stats built into the runtime. So you can pass a flag or execute a little bit of extra code around your app that will uh, tell you how often it's running the garbage collector, uh, how much time it's taking, how many data, how many objects it's clearing out, and so on. So you can see what you're doing to memory, basically. Uh, there are also some simple profilers built in. Most of these are pure Ruby based on like set trace font, like uh, essentially hooks that are in the, in the Ruby API. So they introduce a lot of their own overhead, but the basic profiling, they work okay. And then there are a handful of third-party tools, StackProf, RubyProf, Perf tools, uh, that are varying levels of quality, but, but give you a little bit of visibility. And this is pretty much it. So I, I went looking around for what these other Ruby tools are that people use for performance and other stuff, and there's not a whole lot more that's not on this list. Uh, you do get things like a new relic that's doing application-level monitoring, but not really showing you individually in your application that this function has a performance problem. It's more stack level, you know? So JVM tooling is basically a JRuby tool. Anything that runs for other JVM languages, you can use against the JRuby application and get basically the same results. Uh, so of course, we have a wide range of garbage collectors to begin with. Uh, lots of tuning options, uh, parallel collectors, concurrent collectors that run while your application is still going, uh, pauseless connect collectors, which you can, I think, pauseless collectors mostly uh, are for uh, commercial options but they will never pause your application to do garbage collection. That's the guarantee. So we have these options out here in the JD, and they work just as well with JRuby as they do with a Java application. Uh, then we have tools for analyzing how the GC is working, how the JIT is working, uh, what's happening in IO, what the memory layout looks like, and what, what's being uh, dealt with there. Uh, Built-in monitoring APIs. You can connect up to an application remotely and see what's happening. See what the threads are doing, watch what the garbage collector is doing, and so on. Um, and then more and more of these. There's commercial tools, there's free tools. Uh, the one I want to show here, or one of the ones I want to show, is Visual VM. Um, some of you who used JRuby before might be familiar with this, or if you're familiar with the JVM. Basically, a graphical console that looks into the application, looks into the VM, and shows what's actually happening. You can see what threads are doing, you can see what the garbage collector is doing. Um, this is a, a view of the main tab, the thumbs up. Well, not the main, the overview is the boring tab. Monitor is the basic one. And we've got our uh, application CPU usage, which is not very high, or, or which is the, the orange line. The GC usage is very low on this. I believe this was like a GC benchmark that I was running. Here we have a, a general idea of what the heat looks like. The orange line at the top is how much space is available on the heat, pre allocated and ready to go. Uh, the blue line is how much of that we're actually using. Um, and then you can see how many classes are in the JVM, how many threads are running. Uh, this is probably the more entertaining view. This is called Visual VM, uh, Visual GC, sorry. And this is actually a live view of the garbage collector on the JVM. We can see all the different heaps. We can see the memory going up and down. Uh, we can see our young generation, our Eden space filling up. 
it promotes objects in the survivor space as S0, S1, and then ideally only things that get in the old generation are the ones that are sticking around forever. But you can actually sit and watch this and see what's happening in the heap. How much memory you're using, whether you're slowly trending upward, whether you're leaking memory over time, uh, and if you need to tune any of these things. You can see that just by running this tool. Yeah? Yeah, can you use these tools if you're running JRuby and uh, Docker or some other virtual environment? Yep. Yeah, you can use these. Uh, so this is a graphical tool. So there's a bit of proxy that would be required. But you can basically set up a proxy that lets it connect to the local instance and display it anywhere. Uh, a lot of the, most of these metrics actually are accessible through a, 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 just a plain API too. Uh, we have a JRuby gem, the JNX gem, which you can connect up to any JVM, you can get any of these metrics and monitor it yourself, graph it yourself, whatever you want. So this is just a nice GUI version of it, but these are all published on a, a remote port if you want to. Does this require oracles? Uh, no. Or, or is this something? This one, this one doesn't. So Visual VM and the Visual GC plugin and all the other plugins for Visual VM, this is all free. Uh, so if you install Oracle JDK, Open JDK, you're going to get Visual VM out of the box. Just connect up to any process. I use it all the time to look at my local JRuby stuff when I'm working on it. Uh, we have used it a couple times to connect with all the processes, just have to open a few ports and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is free. Uh, the next tool here, Java Mission Control, this is a technically a non-free tool from Oracle, but it's free for development. So it's free, it's free for us. Uh, we can use it if we want. So this is, this is similar to the visual VM monitoring of the application, but it's something that you can run against a production server if you want. The overhead is extremely low, a couple percent of, of performance hit to your application, and you can monitor all the same stuff that visual VM does in production. Uh, visual VM has a little bit more overhead. And then you can take your results offline and go into Java. So the, the, the runtime tool is called uh, Java Flight Recorder, I believe. Uh, and it's only available in the closed source builds of Oracle's JDK, which is essentially open JDK. Uh, but you can use it for free. And if you're doing some quick monitoring or investigation of an application, that works. The, the offline tool, the GUI tool I'll show, is called Java Mission Control. Um, and then that goes and takes a look at this, this dump of information from the VM and analyzes all the same stuff that your VM runs. Uh, so you pull off a recording, you can tell it to just constantly run in the background or to record over a period of time. So if you have a current application that's in production, you've got some problems with it, and you pay the Oracle tax, uh, you can connect up to it, record data for a while, and then analyze it to figure out what's wrong with the application offline. Or you can just do this in development and not pay for it. Uh, so we have this view, this is the main view that we get in uh, Mission Control. Uh, so we've got a number of options here. We've got heat usage across the top. We've got total CPU usage. We've got the amount of time that's being spent pausing in GC. Again, similar metrics to what we have in Visual VM. Uh, and then we have a, a, a more graphical view of what the, the heat actually looks like. We can see this progress over time. If these peaks eventually take a top out and don't continue to grow over time, you know we've got a good, a well-behaved application. If those peaks continue to go up forever, well, we'll probably have to do it somewhere. We need to fix that. Uh, so that's the main pane here. Let's take a look at, this is another one I like. This is actually showing object allocations over time. Um, so with each iteration of the application, a number of large objects get created in memory, and we have our pump up. Um, and you can actually turn on some modes that will drill down further into this and say where these objects are being allocated in your code, and then go and find it in the code, fix it, if it's something you can improve. So I mentioned all the GC stuff. Uh, tons of JC, tons of garbage collection options, tons of tuning options. Sometimes a baffling array of tuning options. Um, but having those options there means you can make it run the way you need it to. There are also other tools out there, uh, gceasy.io. Basically, you can take garbage collector logs from any JVM dump them onto this website and it will say, here's some problems here, you're allocating too many objects in this generation, you've got a steady leak in this one, uh, just throw it into this app and it'll analyze that. JClarity gives you a bit, a little bit deeper view into it, uh, and I believe JClarity can also look at uh, CPU caches, and if you're, if you're 
you're doing bad things to the CPU cache that are causing more memory loads or you know, it's blowing the cache out. Uh, so a little bit deeper stuff. That one's a commercial product. Uh, but the bottom line is that this is just a few hand, a handful of things that I, I brought up to the top. Uh, these are the best garbage collectors in the world. These are the best tools for a VM in the world. Uh, and you can have all of it using JRuby too. Okay, so actually finding bottlenecks in the application. This will be the last section, I think. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about profiling and what options we have on JRuby. So on JRuby, we have some command line profiling options. Dash dash profile is a Ruby level uh, time profile. So it would be actual time spent in Ruby methods. Uh, so you run that, you'll get a basic uh, output I'll show in a moment. Dash dash sample is a JVM level sampling profile. So periodically it just pings the runtime to see where it's at. And then it tallies those up. If you're spending a lot of time in this method, well, maybe that's an expensive method. Uh, it's not as accurate because it's just what happens to be going on at this moment, uh, but it can be very lightweight. So you can run this against an application that doesn't slow it down as much. Uh, there are many other JVM command line profilers, uh, GUI profilers, some of them are free. Uh, there's at least one built into Visual VM. Uh, there's another one called Your Kit, it's very nice. Several options out there. Um, and I'm, I'll show a few here. Uh, so this is the dash dash profile output. Uh, this is running the red black tree benchmark again. And uh, so I, pointing out how it's a little bit misleading, object rbtvm is basically the benchmark function. That's not useful, not really interesting for the benchmark, but obviously we're spending <coughs> most of our time in there because that's the whole body of the application. But if we look down the list a little bit, we can see red black tree add, red black tree insert, things that you would expect to see in the profile start to show up higher. Um, and then more importantly, what's not important to look at? What do we not need to optimize? Parent works, left and right work line. Leave those alone, they're very low on this chart. So focus on insert and insert helper to improve the performance here. Uh, this is a similar benchmark, or similar uh, uh, profile done with the JDM tool. Uh, you'll notice that these names are a little bit mangled because we have to fit them into the JVM and we want to have enough context. So we've essentially got the path to the file and then the actual method that's executed. So it's the bench red flag file, here's the method names, uh, and then roughly the same information. So there is all of our different methods that are executing. On the other column we have where we're spending all of our time doing our execution. This is just Ruby code being profiled by a JVM profile. Okay. So I mentioned uh, in the, one of the previous slides, there's actually other libraries. There's flame graphs out there. Uh, this is uh, from a Facebook project, I believe, that can do JVM level of stack bar, uh, figuring out what's actually happening at the library level versus a JDK level versus your application level and giving you a flame graph that shows where the performance is going. And this is available for JRuby and this works just fine. Uh, this is an example, not based on JRuby. This is a Nebby application. I think it's probably a, uh, uh, it's got a little bit of a Ruby front end on it, but it's mostly a different language. But this is just the beginning. So there's lots of these tools out there, lots of options for optimizing this stuff. Okay, wrapping this thing up. So Ruby is alive and well. I do a lot of Ruby conferences, and they just year on year, they continue to grow everywhere I go in the world. Um, there's not a lot of crazy new exciting stuff in Ruby every day. Uh, and you know, Rails is pretty much just an established standard. Uh, Ruby itself is not making any crazy changes, but Ruby conferences seem to be doing just fine. Uh, and CRuby itself continues to improve. It's not that just that we're doing this work. The CRE folks really do want to get performance and parallelism where it needs to be. They are doing this work. It's just going to take a while. The stuff that's going on for Ruby 3 is very exciting. I would like to see them get a JIT in there. I would like to see them find some way to do parallel execution so that they're, they're not wasting resources that they're running on. Uh, but if you want this today, JRuby's performance today. JRuby is real concurrency, real parallelism today. Uh, and we have the tools today that can get your application where it needs to be. And I think JRuby will make you a happier Ruby developer. You will not have to worry about these problems. You do not have to wait until 2020 to have a good, solid, next, uh, fast app application. Uh, so give it a shot. 
Uh, I'm here in town. Tom Evo's here in town. So if you guys ever want to hang out and talk about your app, see what we can do to get it on JRIP, let us know. Buy us a beer. It's easy. That's our consultant fee. Buy us a beer. Uh, and that's it. That's all I have today. Thank you. it's one-to-one. -one. It works just fine. Uh, where it gets to be more of a challenge is if you have an established application that needs to provide lots of dependencies, probably some C extension dependencies. You're going to have to kind of go through those one by one and figure out what the JRuby equivalent is and map that over. Uh, but we, we've done a really good job of having most of the, the core libraries, Nobugiri works, JSON works, uh, most of the, the interesting native libraries have JRuby. Usually the conversion is pretty easy. Yeah. Uh, we're on a pre-9000 JRuby. Okay. How's the startup time changed as you go to 9000? Is there an improvement there? Uh, we run, I run tests a lot. Right, right. right. Uh, the performance on JRuby 9000 is, I think, is roughly the same right now as 1.7. We have some ideas to improve it, but we haven't managed to put a lot of those in play yet. Uh, hopefully, you've seen the JRuby startup time wiki page, which has a lot of tips. Uh, you've seen it, but last time I looked at it, it looked like it was a little low. Is that up to date? It should be. It should be fairly up to date. So the big one that you would want is the dash dash dev flag we had about halfway through last year. Okay. Is it free now? No, that, that's, that's available for all, all JRPs. Yeah. Uh, and dash dash dev essentially it turns off our compiler, it turns the JVM's compiler to a, a simpler mode. And that can be as much as a 50% improvement in startup time. So that is by far the biggest way to get better startup. Uh, going more advanced stuff, we have uh, background JVMs that can run, like Drift and whatnot. But like that, that, it's, so you always have a warm depth JVM in the background. Uh, most of that stuff should be on the wiki page. But the dash dash dev flag, if you're not using that now, that'd be a big one. That basically it improves uh, JRuby 1.7 by almost 50 percent, and 9K is, is probably the same with that flag. It makes a big difference. Yeah, thanks. Any um, uh, what hooks are you using for with the uh, uh, Java? 1.8 or Java 8 with the lambdas. Right. Um, so we most of what lambda does at the JVM level is all is mostly compiler tricks. So there's not a lot of JVM stuff that we actually use out of that. Uh, they kind of just magically turn these blocks of code into interface implementations, which we've been doing for years. So a lot of what lambda gives you in Java 8, we've already been doing. Uh, we are over the summer and, and even a little bit already, we've been working on making sure that JRuby integrates with those APIs well, so that you can just pass a block as the Lambda that does all this stuff. Uh, most of the time, since it's just an interface, it should work okay. It should, it should work as well as Java 8 stuff. Uh, but we're looking to see what parts of the API we can do better. Yeah. Um, are you currently considering doing any caching of compiled? Files, right? Like five lambdas, right? So one of one of the uh, one of the approaches to getting better startup time would be reducing just the amount of processing we do on Ruby code. Uh, get to the compiled code faster. We do have a persistence backend uh, that we can write out all of our IR to disk and read it back in. Uh, 
the implementation of the current persistence backend is not a whole lot better than just parsing and compiling. Uh, just reading in a thousand little objects and constructing them off of the stream is too expensive with the current implementation. We're looking at possibly uh, reworking that to be more like a protocol buffer sort of thing, where we can just say, here is the code, give us a map of the objects on top of it, and we don't have to construct anything. Uh, that may be a big boost for us on performance, but that's this summer we're probably playing with it. I've been wanting to jump on that. The other thing is we don't do any uh, pre-compiling to JVM bytecode ahead of time. Uh, you can do it, but it's only been for obfuscation purposes. It doesn't actually speed up the booting time of the application uh, Just because the JVM still has to go and verify all that code and make sure it's working properly. That's expensive. Uh, so we're looking at both of those halves, saving the code off in a more efficient format on disk and possibly saving the most optimized form, the JVM bytecode, just jump right back in. Anything else? Yeah. What, what sort of improvements are you expecting to see out of Truffle? So Truffle, they've shown really good straight line performance improvements. Um, and this is out of Oracle Labs. It's all a bunch of PhDs and students and whatnot working on this stuff. Very much research. Uh, they're trying to say, with this runtime, what is the absolute fastest we can get Ruby to go? Uh, unfortunately, absolute fastest straight line Ruby translates into incredibly slow warm up and startup time uh, and memory footprint. They have a tremendous memory footprint compared to regular JRuby. We're talking 100 gig or 100 meg application in JRuby, a gig in Truffle. So, what I, if, right now, if you want to run something super fast in Ruby, Truffle probably would be great. Uh, it might take a while to get up and going, but it's going to be the fastest, probably by five to ten times compared to what JRE is right now. Uh, those tra those trade-offs are fine, and you can do it. What I really think is going to be interesting about Truffle is when they start to scale back and see what's practical about it. I think they will still probably be able to get most of that performance, maybe, maybe have a 25% or 50% hit, still be significantly faster than what we have now. Uh, but we're kind of waiting for them to get practical about the runtime so that it can be used in regular application. But it's, it's exciting stuff. Hopefully, it'll continue to go on. We got a lot of people working on it. Yeah. For the JDKs out there, um, when would uh, one use OpenJDK? When would one use Oracle? Uh, in in your in your experience? Sure. Uh, Oracle JDK and Open JDK are 99% the same thing. Uh, Oracle introduces a few of their own commercial options, like the Flight Reporter stuff that is commercial. Um, I think there may be some GC configurations that are that are proprietary, or you have to have a license, and then it's like a support thing. Uh, but for the most part, just you can run with Open JDK anywhere you want. You're basically going to have the same app. Uh, it's only if you need any of those commercial features like Flight Reporter that you really need to go to Oracle, or if you're in an environment where every piece of software has to have a support contract, then you might go to the Oracle one. But otherwise, it's the same thing. We test on Oracle on OpenJDK all the time. Well, so we, we run OpenJDK locally, and we have builds that run against both of them, and they're essentially the same. Thank you. Yeah. For the people who are running Rails, uh, what what containers are they using? Are they typically using Tomcat, Cloudfly, Gustfish? So for folks coming to JRuby that are asking that question, um, if you're just doing a standard Ruby sort of deployment, we just recommend Boom. A standard command line server, pure Ruby, simple works fine. Uh, that's that's what 90% of the people that are deploying on JRuby use. And you know, we're talking a lot of small services, a lot of back-end things, Puma works fine for that. If you need more of an enterprise sort of deployment where you've got a bunch of services running in process, then we direct people towards uh, like a Tomkins setup or a TorqueBox, uh, or a JBoss. TorqueBox is basically JBoss <coughs> slash Wildfly uh, turned into a series of Ruby APIs. So you can say, spin up a background job, give me a message queue, uh, do all this stuff but it's all one process. You don't have to manage a separate queuing service and a separate uh, background job service and whatever else. One process, it's all just configured. So
So if we're going to need all of those things, then it starts to get beneficial to go to that sort of server, like a torque box. Uh, and then the, the most extreme, if you actually have to deploy in a regular Java environment, then maybe you use a Tomcat or a war file or whatever. But that's never a first recommendation for a Rubius. They would never want to do that in the first place. That's only if you have to do that. Uh, so Puma, TorqueBox, and then whatever Java server in, in order of preference. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the current Ruby jam. It's a little tangential, but uh, is that a persistent data structure system? I don't think so. There are a couple other ports of persistent data structures. So folks who aren't familiar, uh, persistent data structures are like from Clojure, where you've got a list or a, a map or something, and you make a change, and what you get is a new map, rather than having a modification of the existing map. So whatever you have in hand, you know is never going to change. Any modification is going to be the new object. Uh, there are a few, there's at least one pure Ruby library out there, uh, Hamster, which is a pure Ruby port of all the Clojure collections. There's also a couple of native versions that I believe have C and JRuby versions. Uh, none of those have been rolled into the current Ruby. It might be a good idea, especially since you've got things like reps and futures and whatnot, where you'd like to have immutable data structures floating around. Um, just have to kind of run it by the current Ruby guys and see. It's got to be such a big library. It really, it literally does have everything. Like futures and promises. Like, okay, well, the, the, the applying line between these two things. I guess promises can trigger other stuff. Sure, but there's like two or three versions of every possible concurrency API. I would like to see a, a, a data structure thing, but that becomes by shit territory too. Which implementation? And is it native or not? And all that. So, yeah. Another tangential question, kind of related to that. There used to be an actor implementation called Second Celluloid. Yep. I was wondering how that was related to the current Ruby project. Did they pull that in, or that's separate? Um, so Celluloid is a really nice actor framework. It's based. It's it's designed very much around uh, usability from a programmer perspective. So you get an actor, and you're not like send this message, this specially crafted message to the actor, and it'll do something. You just call a method, and it transparently proxies that into an actor call and makes it asynchronous for you. Um, that introduces overhead. So Celluloid is a very nice API, but sometimes that overhead for small actor jobs can be an expense. So I've seen people switch from Celluloid to uh, concurrent Ruby with just straight up uh, executors, where they just throw a block to it and it just executes, rather than doing the nice API. And I've seen people go the other way, from concurrent Ruby, which is less structured, to Celluloid, which just looks like normal objects. Uh, but they're not really related right now, and I don't believe Celluloid uses anything in current Ruby. All right. Yes, that. All right, thanks.